Let me introduce Gerd very briefly and hand over to him. Uh, Gerd is a well-known futurist, author of five books. Uh, his background is in music and publishing. Uh, in 2006, the Wall Street Journal referred to Gerd as one of the leading media futurists in the world. Uh, Gerd is a member of the Royal Society for the Arts here in London, and he is a member of the uh, tantalizingly named World Future Society. So over to you in the future, Gerd. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so the future. Let's just switch my future machine on here. All right, good morning. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I was on vacation last week in Madeira, hiking, being offline. Now, this is the new luxury, is going offline. So I was quite luxurious last week. Um, so I run a company called the Futures Agency, and uh, this is sort of what we do. Uh, we listen to the future. There is no, uh, there's no rocket science here. Uh, there's a Chinese saying that if you want to know about the future, ask your children. And so that's what we do. We kind of look around three to five years from now all over the world to see if we can share foresights with our clients. And our clients include many, many different kind of companies, media companies, technology companies, and so on. Uh, I'm G. Leonhard on Twitter. Um, I have a new uh, gizmo today uh, called GERD Cloud. Uh, if you're looking, if you're bored with the presentation, you can look up a, a network called GERD Cloud. You can see it on the Wi-Fi, uh, and just bring up any browser and uh, type in password GERD Cloud, and you can access all of my presentations, my books. Uh, my latest book is called The Future of Content, and it's free on GERD Cloud. It's also free on the internet, of course, but you know. so you can download it there, or you can get the Kindle version. But Basically, just use GERD Cloud if you want to download the presentation. Also, afterwards, it's not currently on there because I changed it just a few minutes ago. I will put out the latest PDF uh, later on, and you can download it from GERD Cloud. Okay, but only if you're not actually going to listen to what I have to say, then you can play with the GERD Cloud. Okay. All right. So first of all, of course, you know that data and connected to the internet is absolutely exploding, right? I mean, if you're looking at this graph here from Jess3.com. Storage cost dropping, network access increasing, CPU cost dropping, bandwidth cost. I mean, this is actually beyond Moore's law. Right? I mean, it's mind boggling. And this is happening on a global scale. Right? The other three billion are coming online, Brazil, Russia, India, China, Indonesia, right? at very fast pace. Clearly, you know, we can expect significant amount of disruption and innovation, which is pretty much the same thing. Right? This box, right? what was it called? It was called? Uh, now I forgot the name of what it was called. Um, it's a medical device that analyzes what you do. Uh, the tricorder is becoming real now. There's a, a thing called the Tricorder X Prize. You can uh, sneeze into this machine and you can prick your finger and it will do analysis of your health and supposedly beat a doctor in the analysis in terms of speed and accuracy, which is doubtful, I, I would say. <laughs> or beat a lawyer for, you know, for all cases. But, but uh, that's becoming reality now, so disruption all over the place, right? And this is disruption uh, in the television business with a company called Aereo. Comes in over the air, through an antenna, dish, cable, and then there's the internet, wherever and whenever we want. Sure, it's got video, but it's not TV. The real live 24-7 TV we know and love, it's not on the internet, until now. Now there's Aereo, a new platform for bringing live broadcast TV to the internet wherever and whenever we want it. Here's how it works. Anyone can watch live broadcast TV for free off the air with an antenna. Aereo has taken that antenna and made it unbelievably small. Small enough that hundreds of thousands can fit in a single room where you can access them from the internet and watch live broadcast TV as it airs. Pick and choose the TV you want. So this is Barry Diller's new project and, and he has already gotten sued for it, of course needless to say, but it's actually up and running in New York, right? Putting all of regular television stations into your app and charging for it as well. Yeah. So disruption is a new normal. Uh, there's a great report by The Economist on disruption and is listing a whole bunch of things about disruption. I mean, every single point of these, cheap smartphones, business social networks, data mining, cloud computing, holographics, all that stuff, it's, it's all happening now, right? This is all our sign sort of science fiction stuff from Cory Doctorow's novels, you know, it's all real now. Right? Pretty mind-boggling, all happening at the same time. All right, so basically, I, I said this last year, you know, you can either be disrupted or you can disrupt. Those are the choices, right? So if, if you're in the media business, you have to find a way to disrupt and add more value. Right? 
So that's quite clearly a tall mission. And we're having this uh, what's called SOLOMO, Social Local Mobile, is a keyword used by Kleiner Perkins, investor in Twitter and Facebook. I would add the cloud to this. So we're living now in a world of social, local, you know, local services, Foursquare and so on, mobile and the cloud. And this is becoming reality now for five billion people in the next three years. Right? So a lot of things will dramatically change because of this if you're looking at uh, the impl implementations of this. Uh, the future is already here. If we are willing to accept it. And this is the key question, of course. Right? Are we actually willing to look at the future and what it brings to us? I mean, the Google Glasses, uh, ga gadgets on television, gestures. Right? This is Siri showing you a way to remote control. Bring up the sound, please. Remote control your television using Siri. There you go. This is a hack, of course. You right? can do something like play Seinfeld season six, episode five. All right, so these kind of devices, and this is a automated translation devices. You can speak in English, it comes out in Japanese. Imagine what this will do to media if you can speak in English and it comes out in Chinese or in German of all languages or of whatever, right? This is going to happen in three years. And then there's people like us uh, who are basically, you know, uh, an older generation trying to make this work. And we have issues like this. This, unfortunately, is missing. But um, so now we have our kids already being quite familiar with this new way of, of touching and, and making things work. The iPad is very popular with kids, I'm sure you know, because it's easy to use, right? And then we have kids who are encountering something else that is not the iPad, and they're wondering why the magazine doesn't zoom, <laughs> right? So I, I think you, you will find that this is becoming an attitude among digital natives, you know, why doesn't it work like this? And the answer is not to go back to them and say, you know, please change your habits because it fits my business model, you know. We can try, but it's, you know, then we're going to end up like this guy, you know, like this guy on the left here who is struggling with technology and, and, and mistaken uh, the iPad for a cutting board, you know, th then we're sort of like this, right? We don't really know what the users are actually doing. Right? And uh, yeah, I, I don't recommend you do this at home. But anyway, uh, now we're entering a society to where all the screens are connected, all the screens, right? Including my wristwatch, my eyeglasses, my iris even, right? all connected to the web. And basically, people are expecting that we can engage with all these screens, as, as the Intel Futurist says, right? That we can basically say, okay, we can comment, we can rate, we can, we can do all these things all the time. And this is why we're, you know, doing the like button, all these things. And of course, the key issue, as we said last year, is the issue of control. Right? Users want to have control over this. And most of you, of course, are on the other end of the equation, receiving the urge of user control, right? I mean, we're not so happy with the user having control over what we do. Clearly, that's an issue, right? Because business models are based to a large degree on control, right? This is a real disparity that the user wants more control and we're willing to give less. In fact, of course, iTunes is the embodiment of that desire to have control back. Right? I use it, but most people don't. Right? It's, it's not financially going to be the future for us. So there are lots of issues about this. Every screen is becoming some kind of connected television or radio. Every screen, right? including the bus stop, right? sending out Bluetooth promotions and all kinds of things. Right? It's mind-boggling. Rapid user experience changes that the Samsung television has motion control, where you can gesture, has voice control, has face recognition. The television recognizes your face. I mean, think about the implementation, the implications of that in terms of privacy. Right? So there's lots of stuff happening that uh, is going to be quite different. If you're looking at what Lady Gaga has done, is completely use all these tools, social, local, mobile, always on, interactive, real-time, cross-media, all those nice words, right? actually put them to work right? and build a whole career on connecting with her fans in this way. Right? That is going to be a standard for filmmakers, for authors, for musicians in the future. So the question really is, you know, are we willing to accept that our chess game is now three-dimensional? I mean, if you're a chess player, I love to play chess, I'm not very good at it, but uh, there are rules, right? I mean, if you know the rules and if you read the books, then you can beat the other guy, right? I mean, simple as that is math, really, right? 
But a three-dimensional chess game is not math, right? It's basically the rules are off. Right? And we're now in the same situation where our chess game is now 10-dimensional, not two-dimensional, not linear. Again, going back to the control issue here. So um, this guy, Bruno Latour, says that if we change the instruments, we will also change the, the social theory that goes with them. And that's what's happening right now. The social theory is also, of course, our business theory. Right? This really comes down to the same thing. Right? So if we're going to use Google Glasses, if we're going to use Facebook, Instagram, if we're going to use causes to donate money, it changes the fabric of society. And therefore also, of course, of business. One key point here is that we're now living in a world to where basically access is replacing ownership. Yeah, we discussed this last year, I think. Right? It's actually true now. And it wasn't hard to predict last year or 10 years ago, really. Right? Access replacing ownership means, for example, music services in the cloud, health records in the cloud, education in the cloud. Right? So think about what that means. That access not ownership is quite tough, actually, when you're looking at, for example, music here. Is a graph from eMarket, the US numbers, right? Uh, digital track sales are sort of flat, not really going anywhere. Streaming and clicking on demand is increasing. So revenues by, by that is increasing, but it's not enough, of course, because there aren't enough people doing it. We'll get to that in a second, right? But clearly the same thing is true for video. If you're looking at these numbers, online video viewers exploding. And you have uh, sites like Viaplay, of course, the Amazon Kindle, Netflix, and next issue, which is doing the Spotify of magazines, right? <laughs> same idea, flat rate for magazines. Right? All that stuff is happening. Our choice is, again, either we're part of this or we're not, but we can't just stand still and say, you know, we're not going to participate because we find it to be disruptive. Right? I mean, artists who are currently opting out of Spotify, right? you have to wonder if the next thing they're going to do is opt out of radio. Right? This is the same issue, really. Right? So, Access not ownership, this is really quite a challenge, and of course, because access is handled by telecom companies, right? <laughs> ISPs and operators. Our partners in, in crime, or not in crime, rather, in solving this problem in the future, are the telcos, right? So there is going to be lots of overlap. I call this telemedia, and within three years, we're going to have a complete telemedia environment to where telcos and ISPs will essentially work with content owners to uh, provide content on, in, in ways that are currently unheard of, uh, except for Spotify and possibly other uh, rated services. But all, me all telecoms will become media companies in the sense of being a platform for media, not producing media. So this is a big topic here. Um, then, of course, the biggest problem here is that, uh, as the, uh, the CEO of FT.com said in the Huffington Post, the deep paradox is that publishers need to unpick is that even as revenues plummet and their faith is shaken, demand for the product is higher than ever before. People love music, people love motion pictures, people love news, but how do they pay? It's the one to 10 rule, basically. Whatever made a dollar offline makes 10 cent online. So we have to refurbish 90 cents from somewhere. We have to generate new values, and that's the mission. Right? Basically, for the consumer, access is cheaper. Okay, we can, we can say that we hate this, and obviously we do hate this. I mean, it's quite clear. You know, if I would, you would prefer for you to buy my book uh, in a print version for $17 and not download it for free or for a dollar, right? But the reality is I can't go back. I can't tell people to buy a copy because that's a better deal for me. Right? I, I can try, and we have tried, but it's not working, right? So basically here, using the Einstein paradigm, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. And that's our reality. And it's, it's actually quite hopeful because I think what's happening here is that if you're looking at, uh, for example, a news business, this is a slide from my friend Ross Dawson uh, in, in Australia. He's talking about all the added values that are happening in the news business, which is how people pay. Filtering, community, relevance, timeliness, novelty, interfaces, insights, design, all that stuff that, that is extra value. This is why I like Flipboard, for example. Right? because it offers me extra value. So the key question really is in this, the value is built around the content. The value is not in the zeros and ones of the download. So when I download a movie, then I have the value. Right? There's lots more value around what I do there. 
And Kevin Kelly calls these the new generatives. And if you want to really know about this, just Google new generatives, Kevin Kelly, who's the founder of Wired, right? And he's mentioned them, for example, immediacy, personalization. Immediacy is the key behind, for example, the Metropolitan Opera in New York. Is, uh, you, can, you can go to a movie theater somewhere in, uh, in Iowa and you can, you can watch the opera remotely, but you can be part of it remotely for $10. And this is an added value, rather than watching on television, you go together in a theater. Right? It's an approximation of the real thing. Metallica has all of the shows available for downloading that you can buy, right? and actually you can subscribe to them. Right? So I want to give you a short demo of this. I hope it works. Let me see, just one second here. It's a little bit technical, but I'm, I'm sure you'd appreciate it, so give this a try here. Um, using my fabulous screening app here. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you here, for example, what happens when I use my iPhone um, using an app that adds value, for example, Spotify. Uh, you can see, for example, the value behind Spotify is not the playlists, right, which I have many of, as you can see, which I really like, and I filled up the maximum here for my 10 euros, you know. So, uh, quite interesting, but the value of Spotify is not that, it's these guys here, my Facebook friends, who have playlists. If I, if I use a playlist here from Adrian Pope, who runs Play It Again Sam here in the UK, all right, it will bring up all of his playlists, and I know he has a good taste in music, so I'm going to subscribe to his playlist and download those songs or listen to them, right? The feature of the friends, and of course, <laughs> 3G is not working very well here, so our cloud is not actually very active here. But uh, in any case, that is the added value. Right? This is why I use Spotify. I mean, I can listen to free music on YouTube, right? Don't need Spotify for that. Right? So I pay 10 euros for the friends feature. Right? Value around the content, and the same goes for this app that you may know, Flipboard. Uh, Flipboard connects you with your Facebook friends and Twitter friends and it generates a magazine, every, every couple of minutes a new version of it, right? Where you can browse to the stories, right? And basically using whatever Facebook friends you have there. And the value of Flipboard is not the story itself, which of course is valuable, right? <laughs> Otherwise it wouldn't be there. But it's the way of finding it, right? It's a curation, it's a curation tool, right? I mean, the same goes, of course, for the Kindle app, which I'm sure you, you've used, right? I mean, what's so great about the Kindle is not that I can buy the book. I can buy the book before, right? But now I can look at all these books and I can synchronize with how far I read it, right? So I can just click on it and it goes automatically to the latest uh, place where I've read it on the iPad or on the Kindle. Right? So that is really a big difference in terms of uh, how media is going to be used in the future. Okay, let's go back to this here for a second. It's probably a more elegant solution than this, but... Okay, so second screens are becoming now the new generatives for television people. Right? Second screens means about 45% of UK residents that are on television are currently using a second screen while they're watching TV, right? which is the uh, iPad or, or iPhone or whatever, Android device, and lots of times talking about the content on the screen. There's already an app by eBay that shows you all the stuff that's being currently shown on screen in the movie. It shows you in real time to buy that stuff on eBay while you're watching, for example, the Ferrari that you can buy on eBay. You know, if you feel inclined to do so. And then of course Facebook, right, going public this year. Will we have a Facebook remote control for television? Yes, not a question of when, just uh, if, but when. Right? Clearly, Facebook is the biggest broadcaster in the world already, with roughly one billion users. So I think this brings up tremendous new opportunities, the social, local, mobile, cloud idea, right? But the question is, if we're jumping from the glass into the bowl, make it a bigger bowl, right? Are we really ready for this, right? Are we ready for those new requirements? And they're based on collaboration. They're not based on lawsuits, right? They're not even, they may be based on law, right? But not on the execution of a 50-year-old paradigm. Right? So we have a significant issue here, right? We have to reinvent how it works together, how we make money. And the money-making part, of course, you know, if we're looking at the issues that we have, are we going to control consumption, make content unavailable, enforce payment, restrict sharing? Well, some of those things may be useful some of the times, but most of the time they don't make money. Right? They do something else. Uh, 
maybe make us feel more entitled to money. But my view is that I think we have to look at this a little bit differently. I think the next three years, we're going to have many uh, policy and paradigm changes as far as content is concerned. Fred Wilson, the lead investor on Twitter, says restricting access to content is a bad business model in the age of a global network that costs practically nothing to distribute on. Distribution is zero, but of course production is still just as expensive as before. Right? So we have a disparity again. The New York Times has now decided in their wisdom to cut down from the 23 pages I could see before to 10 to force me into their payment model, which is 5.95 a week. And I love the New York Times, and you know, I'm quite happy to pay 50 bucks a year, but 5.95 a week, right, to read what's free somewhere else, maybe not, right? So, things like this, you know, I'm a faithful uh, user of iTunes and Apple TV, right? And I watched the movie, and 23 and a half hours later, it gives me this message, I can't finish watching the movie, right, that I've paid for, because there's software saying I can't. Can we really expect this to be the solution for the future? I mean, I know why we're doing this and all this stuff, but it doesn't make any sense, right? It does the opposite. So we're going from a system of independence, which is, you know, Disney, Universal Music, uh, big companies basically having vertical power, to a system of interdependence. I mean, if you look at all the success in the last 10 years, right? Skype, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, eBay, Amazon, right? they're based on interdependent business models which means collaboration and working out, you know, what I call hyper-collaboration. Right? So instead of having hyper-competition, we have to have hyper-collaboration. Why is it that the publishers have not invented Flipboard? I mean, all of their content is in Flipboard, right? And there's many arguments about this, clearly because we don't know how to collaborate. And this is going to kill us if we don't change this, because basically it creates huge opportunities to outsiders. If you see in this, for example, what's happened in the US, the only real place for growth of television, you see it right here, is Netflix. Right? Everything else, not growing. So ease of use, choice, price, added values, brand, translates into dollars. Right? Why are 24 million people today paying $10 a month for Netflix? Right? Are they all like mad? or are they all the exception to the fact that nobody wants to pay? It just shows that it has to be done right, right? And then people will make a payment. So Brazil, Russia, India, China go on online at a fast pace. We're going to have three billion more producers, users, viewers coming online, uh, entering the middle class, which is going to be absolutely huge. And they will have content-loaded devices with freemium access with bundled connection to the web. Right? Using devices like this, this is a, a uh, a tablet from India called the Aakash is $35 for this tablet. Right. The price is going to go to $10. $10 for a tablet. Right. I mean, imagine all the stuff that we can do with 3 billion people right, if we find a way for the commerce model. Right. So, consumption, this is, this is uh, consumption on mobile devices. Clearly, the future is mobile. I predict that between 50 and 75% of all content will be consumed on mobile devices in the next three to five years. That may connect to larger screens, but basically run by mobile devices. So we live in now a world that is referred to a network topology as a distributed network. Moving from the centralized you know, to the decentralized to distributed, so our future looks like this, what I call the network society. And the network society requires networked media. This is our mission, is to become networked, right? To figure out how we're going to offer things in a networked society. Networked media means things like um, uh, central distribution systems, uh, uh, shows that sell direct on the internet, uh, all the different cloud systems, over-the-top content, BBC iPlayer, uh, Xfinity from Comcast, uh, China, Internet, and basically what we're seeing here is that going direct is also becoming a real option. Right. Amazon Kindle. Right. I mean, clearly there's a lot of change coming up in the publishing business by people being able to go direct. And this is now becoming actually feasible. Right? Seth Golden has already said he's doing it. Uh, the Premier League may be sold to Apple. Right. I mean, imagine what that will do to the likes of uh, ITV and others. Right? We may doubt this will happen, but clearly going direct is becoming more of an option 
uh, going through Kickstarter and crowdfunded services and so on. So really this is becoming quite real, you know, looking at this, uh, of course, what it causes is fragmentation. I mean, our, channel, our challenge really here is going to be to figure out how fragmentation can be used or not used, right, or, or be rebundled, be re-aggregated, because everybody's doing different things now. So it's really quite a challenge here that we can see. And then we have social networks, right? Um, no matter what you think of it, right, the interesting part is here that this is a, a game, essentially, right? A gamification and the advertising that will happen there right, are very powerful forces. And clearly we're going to see lots and lots of things where basically we can say that media companies become platforms. I mean, look at the comparative value of new media and old media. Uh, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Netflix, and so on. Uh, in old media, the market value is about even. This will completely flip in the next 10 years. In fact, they will merge, of course. Right? So we're going to see lots of things that will be quite uh, challenging for us, for example, the difference between global smartphone users were roughly one billion now to five billion. I mean, that business model is extremely powerful for everyone that creates content. So, in this social OS, we have to figure out how we can use this new power that we have. And this goes to the, speaks to the issue of data. Right? We have to figure out what we can do with our data and what not. Right? This is a very lengthy process. It's also the first time that this is actually possible, right? So we have to say, you know, maybe sometimes we have to shut up right, and not share something. Right? We have to be responsible. I mean, this is, a, this is a new power that we need to learn, right? And Facebook clearly is shooting to own the socially integrated web. I mean, own it in the sense of Microsoft, right? So there's a question, I think, that for our future is, do we really want more walled gardens? Right? Uh, I doubt it. I think there's a room for it, and we have, of course, a beautiful walled garden right here with Apple and others, right? But I don't think that will work. Uh, advertising real quick, and then we'll wrap up. Advertising, of course, is a driver of, of the content industries, right? About 70% of all content is funded by advertising, uh, rather than people paying directly, or a mixture of the two, of course, right? So we're going to see this disparity between advertising spending, consumer time, as you can see, print, for example, a lot more money spent on print than people actually spend time on. Right? All that is going to shift back towards the web. I mean, if we're looking at these stats, it's quite clear the biggest growth in 2015 is all digital, interactive, social, you know, online advertising. That will impact all of our business models. Right? Because it's roughly $1 trillion that people spend on advertising and marketing. So that funding is going, going to shift, and clearly in the next three years, that budget shifts will be massive and what's called big data, which is what we generate. All, all, all our stuff, our cookies, our, our movements on the web, and, and how we move around, and what we say, and what we like, and what we forward, and all that stuff. Uh, big, t big data will fund big content, in parentheses. Because data is advertising. So clearly, if you're in the content business, you are in the technology business, you're in the advertising business, and you're in the data business. That is actually very close relationship these days. And we are already paying with our data, right? I mean, how does LinkedIn operate? You guys are all on LinkedIn, I'm sure, right? How do they operate? They use your data to attract other people looking at your data. Right? And they make $450 million, I think, or $500 million last year doing this and selling it back to me for $19 so I can spam you, right? I mean, it's amazing, right? I mean, all this stuff is basically as uh, Twitter, it's the same thing, right? Selling our attention back to others who want it. Right? Uh, that's the most traditional way of advertising you can think of, right? So we're paying with our data. And this will become a huge business. I mean, this is clearly the business of Google, Facebook, and others is to have us pay with data. So the question is, you know, if content is free, uh, they sell your information, is that, is that a Faustian bargain? Is that a bargain to where I'm saying, you know, I'm going to get free movies on YouTube, in return they sell my data to advertisers so they can uh, look at my Gmail and, set and, and dish up some interesting ads. Right? But if I don't want that, can I still have it? I mean, clearly this is going to become a major issue in the next couple of years. You know, we also want to retain our privacy. And this is becoming a, a much bigger issue pretty much every day. 
but can we have the cake and eat it? Right? Research by the Wall Street Journal saying if there's a do not track button on a website that would wipe out your data where you're coming from, right, in the browser, right, would you use it? And I, I did the vote, you know, I said yes, 90 percent, right? But how can we expect not to share our data and still get the free stuff? Right? Well, we obviously can't. That would be having the cake and eat it. So there's a real challenge for us in the future. I think the content business model pretty much depends on it. So uh, to wrap up my presentation, two important points. First of all, you can't avoid risk. If you do, you, you run, uh, you run the, the course of looking uh, and saying basically we've considered everything, every potential risk except for avoiding the risk, as the cartoon says, right? So we have to be more uh, risk open. And as Hugh McLeod says, you have to engage or die. I think I said this last year as well. Our choice is not to disengage and just say, well, we won't do this because we don't know what to do or we, we don't want to do it. Right? That would be very bad. I think our future is uh, engagement and figuring out new business models, new generatives, as Kevin Kelly has said. So thanks very much. And we're going to have a discussion later on this. Uh, we're not taking questions now, are we? We're not taking questions now. OK, we're going to have a discussion later. Thanks very much for your time.